check, 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 check. Okay, gang, welcome back. This is going to be our second lecture. So this is lecture B or lecture two. Uh, dealing with chromosomes and DNA, and we're just going to kind of pick up where I left off last time. Um, I am going to repeat a couple of slides here, uh, and that's okay because you guys do not have an assigned textbook reading this week. Um, I did tell you guys that um, in, in your assignment page on the module that uh, I purposely didn't have a reading assignment for you guys because I want you to really focus on how I'm presenting. I want you to focus on the details of the presentation, which are when I draw. That's why I'm drawing so much and some of these videos become a bit long, but I'm really dedicated to making sure that you guys understand this. And if I repeat things over and over again, it's because repetition will really help you understand this. Um, so I, I'm going to kind of go back a little bit and just kind of review some stuff and make sure I take away any anxiety that you guys might be having. So for example, on this slide, um, when we were talking about nit nitrogen bases, um, the reason I'm showing you this and these bases for uh, DNA formation, what are these micromolecules that form DNA, which is a macromolecule. Uh, I, I don't want you to understand these structures in any way. I just want you to know the names, right? I'm highlighting those here. And I want you to know what category they belong to. Are they purines or, or are they the other one, the other category that I had mentioned? Um, why do they call these nitrogen bases? Well, just just it's obvious to see that these molecules contain a lot of nitrogen, right? Um, here, here, here here, right here. So they're heavily, they, they have a, a lot of nitrogen on them. And well, what does that mean? Well, it's just a different type of biomolecule and it contains a lot of nitrogen, which is what we generally see in genetic information such as DNA and RNA, and also what we see in amino acids. And interestingly, amino acids and proteins, right? So if we have DNA, right and we want to make more proteins in a cell so imagine if you're weightlifting and that muscle's just getting bigger right what happens is the protein architecture of that muscle changes and it gets it gets bigger not only does the protein architecture change but also all of the enzymes and all of the proteins within the muscle cell change so what happens is when we exercise we're going to read genetic information in this DNA, right? And that's going to make amino acids, which is going to make these proteins in, in the cell. We'll just say this is uh, protein A, right? Just an ambiguous protein. But the formation of that protein has to come from the DNA, and the exercise is going to turn the DNA on or perhaps turn it off. If you're in a disease condition, it might shut certain things down. Um, so again, the takeaway is if I said, what are four um, molecules that contain a lot of nitrogen and they form DNA, you'll say, oh, I know that he's been repeating this for the last hour, right? And you say, okay, it's one, two, three, four, but it's not uracil because uracil is an RNA, right? And we'll talk about RNA a little bit later. So again, there is that. I also talked to you guys, let me erase this here. I also talked to you guys about ATP. So some of you guys, this is a 288 course. You may not be really familiar with ATP because you haven't had the physiology. You haven't had the exercise physiology, but ATP is the major currency of energy in the cell. And all I wanted to point out with this, this ATP thing is not only is it where we get all of our energy to perform any exercise whatsoever, but it also contains this very similar shape that we've been looking at. So here would be that base, right? We've been talking about the nitrogen bases. This would be a purine, right? because the purine has this extra little thing out there, right? It is bound to the first carbon, right? We know this is a ribose. I'm just going to put an R in there. On the ribose, we have the fifth carbon here, and then we have a phosphate. So it's very similar to what we've been seeing, right? So base, 
sugar, and phosphate, right? Very similar to what we're seeing, what we've seen before. But this one is an energy generating molecule because we have these three phosphates. There's the first one, there's the second one, there's the third one, right? So every time we lose one of these phosphates in a reaction, we get energy. Okay. And we're not going to talk a lot about that. Again, all I'm trying to show you here is that ATP, okay, this this adenosine tri di or monophosphate, right? Tri would be three, di would be two, mono would be one. These are energy producing molecules that have genetic information in them. They also, if we want to have DNA uh, polymerization or build more DNA, we have to invest ATP into that process, okay? So there's this really kind of cool link between our genetic code and energy. And that's why we're talking about this. We're, we gotta focus a lot on metabolism and unfortunately metabolism is all biochemistry. Now there is another molecule and by no means you need to know how to draw this. You just need to know the basics and the basics is what is the name and what does it do? Well, I'll tell you what it does in very simple terms, but this is cyclic, cyclic adenosine monophosphate, all right? or C-A-M-P, or we also call it cyclic A-M-P, okay? Now, what I wanna show you here is, again, look at the structure. Here we have that purine, right? And we know that this is a nitrogen base. It has this little side vehicle here, right? Which we see in the purines. And then it is bound to carbon. Oops, that's the wrong pen, let me get this one. It is bound to the first carbon. Here we have that sugar again, right? That ribose sugar. If we look at the fifth carbon right here, right? So this would be the fifth carbon. You can see what's bound to it. Oh, another phosphate. So we have the same thing here, base, right? Sugar. Okay, fifth carbon. What's on the fifth carbon? Phosphate, right? And this, I'll just put R for ribose, right? So we see that same kind of pattern here again. And cyclic AMP is what we call a secondary messenger. And a secondary messenger plays a really important role in regulating. Here's what I need you to pay attention to. If I ask you on a quiz or an exam, what does cyclic AMP do? You would say it regulates glucose and lipid metabolism. And that's all you really need to know right now. Cyclic AMP has a lot of uh, effects in the brain as well. Um, but it, it also does some things with neurotransmitters. But for what we're talking about in this course, cyclic AMP regulates glucose and lipid metabolism. So it just plays a role in making sure the sugar gets where it needs to go and the lipids get to where it needs to go, okay? Um, and I have a picture here, and by no means do you have to memorize this picture. Let me just clean this up for you and show you um, what cyclic AMP does. Uh, well, I've identified it. Here it is with this green arrow, and I'll put it right here. So here's CAMP, cyclic AMP, or cyclic adenosine monophosphate. And it plays a role in regulating glycogen. It plays a role in regulating glycogen use and glycogen storage, okay? That's all you need to know right here is that cyclic AMP plays a role in energy regulation. That's it. We're not focusing on what it does right now. We just know that it has a very, very similar um, composition as the nucleotides that we've been talking about. So ATP produces energy and cyclic AMP regulates. I'm just going to put R for regulates energy, which means it tells the energy where to go and how much of it is needed, okay? And that's it. So if I asked you what's the difference between cyclic AMP and ATP, you would say, okay, one is used for energy and the other is used to regulate energy, thereby telling it where to go and how much of it to be used. And that's it, see? Even though these slides seem a bit complicated, we're not really going that deep into them. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide.
So the next few slides are going to really kind of just be repetitive because I had done that drawing for you guys talking about how nucleotides basically form. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to have another drawing for you that's going to give you a little more details about that, but it, it's not super important for this class. We're not really talking about how the formation occurs, but I, I did show you that with the Legos, okay? Just to give you a visual, just in case you didn't understand some of this stuff. So this is, this is very similar to what I had already drawn for you. And when you see words like this, fancy words like reaction or, or esterification, that's just a fancy word for reaction, okay? Um... And you don't need to know what that is. Um, this is from a textbook that I used to, uh, to uh, get this information together. And you really don't need to understand this stuff because it's showing you the same picture that I've already shown you, right? We have, we have the base. We have the base. There's two different types of nitrogen bases here. That binds to the first carbon, that binds to the first carbon. Look at what's happening over here, right? We have the fifth carbon, we have the fifth carbon, and we have phosphates that are binding to the fifth, fifth carbon. That's the, that's the takeaway message, right? And you don't need to read this scientific jargon, which is telling you the same thing that I have already showed you. So this is an, one slide. This is another slide showing you the exact same thing, just basically showing you that we have, yep, the whole gangs here, we have the bases, we have the sugars, and we have the phosphates. Now, the reason I, 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 again, I have this there is just to, you don't have a textbook reading. So if these slides, just seen them different ways, just kind of help burn this to memory, then so be it. Um, but we're also going to start talking about what is a truly a nucleotide, because um, when I started the first lecture, I really didn't go into the definition of what the nucleotide was. We did talk about the micromolecules, micromolecules, which were the nitrogen bases, right? Um, the adenine and the cytosine and, and, and that, um, the guanine, right? The nitrogen bases, here they are right here. But what a true, what truly what a nucleotide is, is it's the combination of these three pieces. And there's another major distinction I want to make here and I didn't I just didn't want to confuse you guys early on but this is something that is very important when we're talking about DNA versus RNA okay here's where I need you guys to make another distinction okay I have been referring to that sugar as only ribose okay now we do have ribose in both of DNA and RNA, but DNA is going to have a different type of ribose. So I wanted to burn ribose into your brains, and I think we had done that. So a let's just look at these sugars here. Okay, so one of the major differences between ribose and RNA and deoxyribose in DNA is the difference between this and this, and that's it. And I just want to make that distinction now, and I didn't want to do it early on because it, it, will, it will confuse you, and that's why I wanted to wait until now, okay? So if we kind of look at, let's look at these two sugars, because now, before we get into the difference between a nucleotide and a nucleoside, I want to stop here, which is why I put this big arrow here, and I want to say, okay, so we understand the ribose component, but DNA, contains deoxyribose and RNA contains ribose, okay? And they're very, very, very similar. So let's just kind of, let me zoom in. Can I zoom in here? Is this thing going to play nice with me or, or not? Let me see. There we go. Let's just focus right there on that and we're going to draw here. So we essentially have the exact same molecule here, here, and here. This is what I'm looking at. We have the OH, right? Check check. We have the hydrogen, check, check. We have the hydrogen, check. We have the hydrogen, check. But up, oh, look at this. Here we have an OH versus an H. Okay. And then everything else is the same. Okay. Here we have an OH and an H. Here we have an OH and an H, right? Here we have an H. Here we have an H. And then we have HOCH2. Same thing. 
None of this matters. None of these things here that I highlighted matter except for this small change. Okay, so if we look at this, okay, carbon one, that's a little too thick. Let me make that thinner. Carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, carbon five, carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, carbon five. The only difference between DNA and RNA when it comes to the sugar is this, okay? One has an H, one has an OH, all right? And that is it. So if I were to ask you on an exam, what is the difference between the sugar we see in DNA and the sugar we see in RNA, you would be able to say, let me just go back through it again one more time. You don't have to draw this. You don't have to understand what the hydroxyl groups are doing, what the hydrogen groups, none of that matters. All you would say on your exam is the only really difference is the second carbon contains a slightly different conformation, right? That's it. That's all you need to know. But everything else is the same. So DNA is going to have bases. A sugar, in this case, it's going to have the deoxyribose and a phosphate group. RNA, <clears throat> excuse me, is going to have some bases, but in this one, it's going to have uracil, and that's going to be replaced with something else. We will talk about that in a little bit. It will have a sugar, and in this one, it's going to have just that ribose ring, and then it will also have a phosphate. And the phosphate will bind at the exact same location on both of these types of sugar. So no matter whether we have deoxyribose or we have ribose, this phosphate, as I showed you before, is connecting to this fifth carbon. And look at here, it's connecting to the fifth carbon and it's much the same, okay? So that's the big new piece of information on this lecture is I want you to be able to just kind of differentiate that there are two different types of sugar, one that is in DNA, one that is RNA, very similar in shape, just a difference of a single element, which in this case has the extra oxygen. That's it. Okay. You don't need to know what they do. You don't need to know what the difference is in the hydrogen or the, um, or the OH. Um, that is all you really need to understand. And we are going to move on to the next slide, which is basically going to show you a lot of the same thing here. Um, this is going to talk about, again, the phosphate being added to the fifth group. I'm just repeating this because I drew it for you. You don't have a reading this week. So all you're really paying attention to again, let me show you, we have the base. Um, you tell me now, look at, we have ribose and we have deoxyribose. So this one is focusing on RNA. And let me change the color. This one is focusing on DNA, right? And very similar instructions or in structure. But another major difference is in RNA, the U, the uracil, is replacing the T. Okay. So if we go back to our nitrogen bases, when we have DNA, we have thymine, which is going to make a base pair with adenine. Okay. Those two play together nicely. RNA, or I'm sorry, DNA does not use uracil at all. But when we get to RNA, it changes. Okay. And I'm just kind of setting you guys up for what RNA looks like. When we have an RNA molecule, the uracil will base pair with adenine and thymine is no longer in RNA. And that's what this is showing you here. If we go back to this slide here, it's showing you that RNA, RNA contains the uracil, but there is no T in RNA. It contains the ribose, right? 
which we can see slightly differs from the deoxyribose right here. And we can see that DNA has a phosphate just like RNA. You see that? You see that? It has this sugar ring, right? But it has a slightly different conformation on that second, um, on that second carbon. And it does not have a uracil. It has a T. So DNA has no uracil. This will all make sense when we start talking about transcription and translation. I'm just setting up the pieces for you right now, okay? So if you want to really kind of look at and examine the differences between RNA and DNA, now that we understand that the sugars are slightly different and the bases can be slightly different, this would be an important slide to help you for some quiz questions or some test questions, okay? And again, I'm not asking you to draw anything. I'm just asking you to kind of identify these things. Like if I were to ask you a multiple choice question saying, RNA contains... Um, which of the following? And let's say I said um, adenine, guanine, and uracil. You would circle uracil and say, okay, it contains that one. So I'm just trying to get the, the basics uh, that you can understand right now. Okay, so that's it. And again, um, we're just kind of repeating some information. So now we're going to also talk about something called a nucleoside. And a nucleoside, if you're looking at this, this should, this should be very familiar to you at this point because I've been burning it into your brains. And a nucleoside is a molecule, a nitrogen base, right? So here's that nitrogen base we've been talking about. And it's bound to this pentose ring, which is a sugar or a ribose. Or if we're talking about DNA, a D, I'm just going to put DO for deoxyribose, right? But something's missing here. So you see on this one, we don't have a phosphate. So that's what a nucleoside is. It is a nitrogen-based base bound to a sugar, okay? And then when we talk about a nucleotide, we can see that a nucleotide has a phosphate group. And here's that phosphate group. Okay, so we know that this composition where we have the base, the ring, and the phosphate, that is super, super, super important for making DNA because we know that, again, just repeating because I don't expect you to read. I just want you to listen and take notes off of what I'm drawing. We know that this piece here, the phosphate and the sugar make up this right? And then this green guy here, these are your bases, right? So the backbone, again, is the phosphate and sugar, and the bases protrude out so that they can bind with bases on the other side, right? And we know that, just repeating, these things run from, f let's see, five prime to three prime. You guys know exactly what that is. And they run anti-parallel, so this one goes from 5 prime to 3 prime that way, which means this DNA molecule or this single strand of DNA is going this way, and this single strand of DNA is going this way, okay? And if you're looking over here at this base sugar nucleoside, right? So here's the base, here's the sugar. An example of that would be, um, let's see, you don't really need to know these. Don't, don't really worry about those because I'm not going to talk about that. Just know the difference between a nucleoside and a nucleotide. But the, the major, oops, sorry, the major player in this picture here is the nucleotide because as I mentioned earlier, look at this, AMP, ADP, ATP, right? These are nucleotides. We talked about energy, right? energy. We talked about cyclic AMP also being a nucleotide. We talked about the backbone and DNA being a nucleotide, right? So the nucleotide is what we're really focusing on here. And we know that these things help in energy and they help create structure in the DNA molecule. And that's all I really need to say about that. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about polynucleotides and linking these nucleotides together. And like I said, I already drew this for you, but I'm just 
putting these lecture slides in here so you can read about them if you need to. So when we're talking about the polynucleotide or the polymerization of DNA, look at we, we've already talked about this and I've already drew it for you, but um, I can walk through these slides with you just to make sure that you understand them. So most of this should look familiar to you by now, okay? So we're talking about polynucleotide structures or DNA polymerization, which again, if we have a nucleotide that has, let's say, an A at the base, how does that nucleotide get added to one that's next to it that might have T as the base? And then how does that get added to the next one, which might have C at the base? And how does that one get? At? So this process of adding, 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 that is polymerization or creating a polynucleotide, more than one. Um, so if we look at this picture here to the right hand side, you should be very familiar with this right now. You should see the, the major components so we can see the backbone, right? And the backbone is highlighted in this blue shade. So you see that blue shade right there? And within the backbone, we have, of course, the phosphate and the sugar, the phosphate and the sugar, the phosphate and the sugar, the phosphate and the sugar. So you guys see that. And then on the outskirts here, we have the bases, right? Base thymine, base adenine, base cytosine. And this right here should tell you exactly what we're dealing with because it's only found in DNA, right? Thymine is not found in RNA. So this should show you right here that we are dealing with a DNA structure. Let me erase this. And you should also be paying attention to what is going on here on this second carbon, right? So you see the H, you see the H, you don't see the OH. All right, and if we go back to uh, where is that slide here, you guys can see when we're dealing with DNA, we can only see the H right there, where RNA has the OH, right? So if we're looking at this picture here, we have pretty clear indication that we are dealing with DNA because we see the H on the deoxyribose and we see the thiamine right? So that tells us that we're dealing with DNA nucleotides. Okay. Now, let me, let me isolate some of these nucleotides here. Um, but before we do that, let's look at what I have in the font here. Okay. So polynucleotide formation or polymerization, same thing, is formed by linkage of nucleotides through phosphodiester bonds. And that is something you do need to know. If I set you guys on an exam, what kind of bond do nucleotides use when we have DNA polymerization, polymerization or we have a polynucleotide structure, which poly being more than one nucleotide, right? So that, that makes a lot of sense. And you'd say, oh, I get it. That's a phosphodiester bond. And I want you to practice saying that because that's a mouthful. But if we broke it down into its syllables, we, we have, um, let me make this as easy as possible phospho and even though that's two syllables i want you to look at it as phospho because look what this is referring to phosphate that's why it's phospho that's why i've been showing you guys p p for phosphate pho, sorry phosphate or phospho right so we have the phosphate phospho di what does di mean it means two ester bond. So phosphodiester bond. And what this is saying in, in, in plain English and not scientific jargon is that the phosphate, the phospho, is going to experience two bonds that are going to lock it in place. And where do you think those bonds are located, guys? They are going to be located at five and three. That's why I was showing you directionality, okay? So let's, oh, sorry, that's not right. Ignore that arrow. The direction's going this way because it's showing you five prime to three prime. Okay. Now this isn't really new. I'm just building upon what I've talked about in the first lecture. Now, if I have um, this first nucleotide, I'm gonna highlight it, okay? I'm gonna go around it. There's the nitrogen base. There's the sugar, 
There's the phosphate. Oop, okay. There's nucleotide 1. And then I'm going to do nucleotide 2. Here we go. Here is the adenine. Here is the base. And the blue is the sugar. Here's the phosphate. Follow my cursor. Okay, we have two of them side by side. Now these phosphodiester bonds are going to occur, I've already drawn this for you, at the 5 and at the 3. And if we follow, let me zoom in here. If I follow 3 down, right, where's the phosphate bound? To the 5. Okay, if I follow the 3 down, where's the phosphate bound? To the 3 and to the 5. If I follow 3 down, right, here it is, what is the phosphate bound to? The 3 and to the 5. So a phosphodiester bond is when phosphate, right, here's phosphate, binds to the structure above it at the third carbon and binds to the structure below it at the fifth carbon. That's what a phosphodiester bond is, right? And then if I have this fifth carbon, right, here's the sugar, right, here's the base. If I look at the third carbon again, right, here's three. Phosphate is going to be bound there and at the fifth carbon below, right? And that's how that phosphodiester bond works. So if I asked you what's the glue that holds the nucleotides together when they are uh, binding with one another, you will say phosphodiester bonds at the five, fifth carbon and at the third carbon, and that's it. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, DNA versus RNA linking, and I'm going to kind of start introducing a little bit about RNA now, but mostly we've just been kind of talking about DNA, and again, this is just kind of a surface level thing just to introduce you to the complexities of DNA. And just to kind of draw out some of these uh, images that we've been talking about with DNA and RNA, I, I have this picture here for you. And um, when we're talking about DNA polymerization or uh, nucleotides binding together on DNA, right, DNA, we have what we call polydeoxyribonucleotide. And I want you guys to remember what that is. And I even broke it down um, into kind of more digestible pieces. So we have poly meaning many, deoxy, which means we're talking about that specific type of sugar and nucleotide. And when we, when we draw this out, it will look like this. So we have the first nucleotide binding to the second nucleotide. We know that it starts from a five prime and it's gonna go this way, right? That's gonna bond next to it to a T. And you know we're talking about DNA because it has a T in it, right? And RNA won't have a T. It'll have, let's say, a C again, a T again. We have this polymerization. The DNA is getting longer and longer. We could have G, G, A. Let's just do one more T, okay? And this is going five prime. Oops, sorry about that. That should be a three prime. Five prime to three prime. It's a direction. It's going this way right? And we know that the bonds that are holding these nucleotides together are phosphodiester bonds, right? So I'm just going to say, let's just, I'll just put P, D, B, phosphodiester bonds, right? Phosphodiester bond, phosphodiester bond. And that's what's allowing these nucleotides to be connected together. And when we're dealing with RNA, if you look down here below, it's got a slightly different name, which is poly, again, meaning many, ribo, right, which is meaning, it's talking about that, what's going on at that sugar ring, and nucleotide. And this is going to do the same thing. We're going to have um, these, um, the binding of these, this genetic information um, but one of the things that we'll see different here is instead of a T, we will have a U because U is unique for um, the genetic information in RNA. So we can have a C, we can have a G, we can have a U again, right? We can have an A. And then that is how we start to string together the nucleotides in RNA. Now, the difference, of course, and we'll get into this in more detail, 
is that DNA is going to have two independent strands. We'll say this is five prime to three prime. So we know this guy is running that way. And then we have this one going like this, right? And we'll say that that's five prime to three prime. And we know that this is an anti-parallel relationship. We know that these nucleotides are bound together here, right? These are all the nucleotides connected here. We know that the sugar and the phosphate are making this background. And we know that we have these nitrogen bases popping out this way. And they're communicating to the same with the same kind of backbone here. And we have these nitrogen bases popping out here. And we have these base pairs that, you know, as I said before, A and T like to hang out, C and G like to hang out, right? Uh, and that's happening here. So with DNA, we have a double strand, right? That's what's really unique for DNA, where RNA is going to be a single strand. Okay, so DNA. RNA. Okay. RNA is also going to run five prime to three prime, right? It's going to have a direction. So it's running this way and it's going to have a single strand of genetic information, unlike DNA. So DNA is double stranded and it's anti-parallel. RNA is single stranded and it doesn't have an anti-parallel relationship. Okay. We know that DNA up is going to be made up of nucleotides that will be a T, C, G, and we know RNA is going to meet up, be made up of nucleotides, which are going to be A, U, C, G, right? But the RNA is just going to simply have this type of structure, right? We don't have a double strand. We don't have a helix formation, but the linking is very similar, okay? Um, and that's all I really wanted to kind of drive home on that one is just some of the differences between RNA and DNA. And of course, you guys know that RNA is created from DNA, okay? So generally what we refer to as RNA is mRNA when it le when it's, I'm sorry, that was wrong. Let me write that again. I'm multitasking here. mRNA is the type of genetic information that comes from our DNA, okay? So let's put it in, let's put it in perspective of exercise. Okay. Let's say we have our DNA. Okay. We have our DNA here. Okay. And we know that our DNA, and we'll talk about this when we get into chromosomes, but right now we're just focusing on DNA. We know that we have specific areas on the DNA that are made up of genes. Right. And we know that genes, once they're read, say we're exercising and we, we turn on a gene, right? This means that it's being turned on because exercise is telling us to turn it on. Then we're going to get an enzyme here that's going to come to this gene, read the information that's in this kind of genetic area right here, right? And, and I'm being very vague because I'm just explaining the process. And then essentially what's going to happen is we're going to spit out some RNA from that area all right and let's just say let's just say um this gene is for hexokinase and that is the first enzyme in glycolysis right so let's say we're exercising a lot and we're using a lot of sugar and your genes are turned on because there's signals in the cell that's saying, oh my gosh, we're, we're using a tremendous amount of sugar. We should probably boost up the enzymes in the cell. Let's make more of these things so that we can handle more sugar. We can create more ATP and we can run farther and faster because the energy is being generated faster. So what's going to happen is the cell's going to tell the DNA to, hey, we're getting, we're getting killed here in this glycolysis process. We need more of this hexokinase. We need you to make more. So the gene is going to turn on and it's going to start producing RNA, which will eventually be turned into a protein. And in this case, that protein is hexokinase, right? And that protein is then going to go inside of the cell and help 
in making more energy. And if you don't know what hexokinase is, it's okay. I'm just showing you a basic of the relationship right now, okay? So when we're talking about DNA, we're talking about genes that are gonna produce more proteins that will ultimately help us in our desired goal for exercise. So uh, that's just kind of putting all that together. So RNA is going to be directly related to DNA. And whatever the stimulus of exercise is, let's say we're running long, long distances versus sprinting. Long distances, if we're exercising for a long time with long distances, that might turn on a gene over here, right? In this particular part of the DNA. And because we're exercising so much in that capacity, this gene is going to be like, hey, what's going on here? Something's happening with the metabolism. We need to create, let's say, let's say this RNA to help us metabolize more fat, right? And then this RNA here that is produced from the DNA is going to make more proteins to help increase the use of fat to increase ATP and energy. So that's kind of how, how this is all going to kind of working together. But I'm showing you the DNA structure first so that we can understand how those genes are going to turn on and how they're going to produce RNA. Okay. So just to simplify it, if you guys don't know this, we have DNA. DNA is going to be read in a process called transcription. That DNA is then going to make RNA. That RNA is then going to make proteins to help the muscle in some sort of capacity. I'm just being very vague. And those proteins are going to help us get stronger in some sort of way. This is my muscle. Don't make fun of my muscle. It's just it's just getting bigger, right? And here's a very happy person with a massive muscle. I, I'm definitely not an artist, so we'll just put shorts on this person, all right? So that's how the muscle is going to increase its performance, is the DNA has to be turned on. And I'll, in, in, when I say turned on, we could also say activated. And this will all make sense as we get into the next lecture. Um, and, and just to kind of show you what happens when you activate it, basically when you activate DNA, it goes from something like this, right? Where the double helix is tightly bound together like that to something like this. Okay, and you can see how it's been broken here and the nucleotides are no longer bound to their base pairs, right? We talked about the Legos here that are binding these nucleotides together. Well, those bonds are broken and the genetic information in a gene is basically split open like this so that we can read this genetic material here, right? So we can read what these what this dna is basically um designed to produce so this might produce a certain enzyme right this might produce a receptor on the cell somewhere this might produce um a structural protein right um so if we want to put more of something in the skeletal muscle to make it perform better, it has to come from the DNA. And the DNA will turn it turn that message into RNA. And then RNA will then create the protein that is somehow going to help the muscle, which will help performance. Um, so let's switch back over to the slides. Okay, so on this next slide, it's just, uh, it's just kind of another... Um, slide that was talking about the ATP. It's not really important since I already kind of went over all that. 
um, we did talk about this anti-parallel piece. See, this is why I'm drawing things for you. So then when you come to these slides, you're like, oh, it makes sense. And, and if you wanted, let's just look at this. Let's see if this picture identified uh, the directionality of it because we know that it is directional. So uh, perhaps since this one isn't telling us, we can assume that this strand here is, sorry about that, let me fix that. This strand here is five to three, right? And this strand here is five to three. And if you pay attention to this and this, they're opposite, which means they're going in opposite directions, as I've indicated here by the, the arrows. This and this tell you that they're going in opposite direction. And um, when I talked about those Legos in between the base pairs, we are now talking about hydrogen bonds, okay? So that's the Legos between the T and A, and between the C and the G and between the T and the A, and the T and the A, okay? So we have here, 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 phosphodiester bonds, and in the middle, we have hydrogen bonds, okay? So those are two things that you need to know. I already talked about the phosphodiester bonds and hydrogen bonds. You guys should all be very familiar with those. That's basic science from high school, um, but that's what's connecting these together. And as I showed you on just that last picture where I drew, let me just zoom out and kind of draw it again. When I showed you guys that uh, when a piece of genetic information needs to be read, we see that the strands of DNA separate like this, right? And if they separate like that, right, here's the two sides, here's the two sides, here's the two sides. When they separate like that and we have nucleotides exposed here, and here, what happens are the hydrogen bonds between the nucleotides are broken, okay? So that's my broken sign, right? So those bonds are no longer um, bonding the base pairs together. Now, what's interesting is if we talk about the phosphodiester bonds, right, which I told you are in here, those are super, super, super strong. But when we're talking about... Um, these uh, hydrogen bonds, those are fairly weak bonds. And, and that's purposeful because we want this to be able to be split open so that we can read the genetic information here because these sequences will basically transcribe for some genetic piece of information. Um, if we look at the next slide, again, talking about the anti-parallel thing, you guys can look at that. Uh, it's just another picture. You guys should be very familiar with this now. Again, by no shape, by no means do you have to remember how to draw that. This is just talking about the parallel and anti-parallel function. Um, and let's move to the next slide. All right, guys. So uh, on this slide, and let me assure you, we are almost done. I'm just, uh, we got a couple more slides here, and I'm just going to kind of draw a few more pictures for you just to make sure that we understand how this DNA, nucleotides, um, backbone, um, micromolecules being turned into macromolecules, just kind of how all this kind of plays together. Um, so here I have a couple of definitions for you. Um, and I'll draw some of these things out as well. So if you're confused at, at all, we can we can talk about it. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about is um, the genome. And the genome is, you guys should all be aware of what this is. It's the complete set of genetic information in an organism's DNA. And generally, the genome, I'm just going to draw this just to be generic. We're talking about, if this is a cell. We're talking about all of that genetic information here in the nucleus. I'm just going to put an N for a nucleus, right? All of our genetic, genetic information, our genetic fingerprint, we are genetic snowflakes. We all have very unique genetic information. Uh, it is all housed in the nucleus of the cell. And uh, that would be what the genome is. It's the complete set of genetic information. Now, we also have something called a chromosome, and a chromosome is a single molecule of DNA, and these things can generally be circular or linear. So you've all seen pictures of chromosomes, and if you haven't, I have them right here. Look at that. So chromosomes can be, they can look like this, right? Um, they could also 
that's one chromosome that could look like this, right, where they kind of go in different directions. I'll, I'll show you um, how we can map chromosomes in a moment. But chromosomes can have many different shapes. And chromosomes are uh, just essentially small pieces of genetic information that are also in the nuclei, right? So the genome is essentially all the chromosomes, and the chromosomes are just kind of individual pieces of genetic information. And then we have a gene. So, so what is a gene? So a gene is a section of DNA coding that will produce proteins. Okay, so genes, if I have a chromosome here, I'm going to draw this in pink. Here's my chromosome. Genes, uh, let me do this, pick that guy. Genes are kind of represented all over the chromosome. So there's different genes. And these genes, once we get access to them, they can produce proteins. And what kind of proteins can they produce? Well, for the sake of uh, what we're talking about with exercise and physiology and performance, we're going to look at how these genes can be activated through exercise to start upregulating or producing more. Upregulation means producing more, where downregulation means producing less. More of these proteins that are going to help us with performance. Okay. And then we have karyotype or karyotyping. And this is just kind of a way that we can map out a person's um, genetic information. So we could literally take a snapshot of somebody's genetic information in a process we call karyotyping. And that's basically this right here. So um, we can obviously tell if you have XY or XX chromosomes. You can see down here. Um, and then we can also look at the shape of individual chromosomes. And this is kind of showing you how they can be circular or linear or a combination of the two, right? So obviously we have 23 sets of chromosomes and this would be karyotyping and this would be how we actually can look at somebody's genetic information. And <clears throat> not only can we look at genetic information, we could also look at, <clears throat> sorry about that, what genes are on what chromosomes. And we can see what genes on these chromosomes are producing what type of proteins. And we see this a lot in cancer, right? We see that certain genes will turn on by themselves and they won't turn off. And they'll tell the cell to start doing certain things, uh, maybe dividing and growing. Um, we'll see in diabetes, uh, certain genes will shut off. And when we have certain genes shutting off, that will impact metabolism in a very negative way. So we can also see how exercise can maybe turn this gene back on, right? So if we have someone that's, I'm sorry about that, let me go back. If we have somebody that is, um, let's say, I'm just gonna draw a dumbbell, right? Oop, oop, that's my dumbbell, right? Someone's exercising a whole bunch, my arrow's going up means that they're exercising a lot exercise might be able to turn that gene back on, right? Turn it back on and restore metabolism. And now we have a healthy system. And that's why we are going to tell you throughout your career here uh, at uh, HSU or not HSU, Cal Poly Humboldt, that exercise equals medicine because we can do a lot of good with exercise and when we're doing it it's all acting upon genetic material so that's why this is so important um here's just some basic information talking about you know, human dna facts um, the genome is 3.2 billion base pairs of dna you should be saying oh base pairs that's what he was talking about right so so let's just let's just go back right here's our dna here's our base pairs what kind of Legos is what kind of Lego is binding that base pair together, right? The hydrogen bonds, right? Now it's all kind of coming together. What can a base pair consist of? A, T, C, G, G, C, C, G, T, A, T, A, U, T, 
U T. So I basically purposely made a mistake there and hopefully you caught it. Um, I want you to think about that for a second. If we're talking about DNA and we're talking about these nitrogen bases, where was the mistake made? And I'll give you guys a second to think about that. You should be saying right here and right here because T and U do not pair with each other. T pairs with A and U is only found in what? R N A. So if you got that, good. Um, and we'll talk a lot about RNA in the lec next lecture. So you guys can kind of look at this here, but we have 23 base chromosomes, which I kind of said to you guys. We have double helixes. We, we know about that. We can basically map out somebody's chromosomes. Um, and then um, you guys can also read this on your own. So what I want to do now is I want to do a couple more drawings for you before we get into the next section. So hold on, let me switch slides here. So what I have a drawing of here is um, just a basic figure to kind of tie some of these things together so that we kind of, we really zoomed in a lot with the, with the base pairs, right? When we talked about the AT and all that, right? The DNA, we talked about the anti-parallel direction, right? Five prime to three prime. But now let's put this information somewhere. So I have, I have this cell that I drew for you guys, right? Um, here it is. This is my cell, right? This is the membrane, right? Here's the cellular membrane. Okay. And inside the cell, we obviously have the nucleus. Every cell has one. If we're talking about skeletal muscle cell, right? We're talking about cells that are very long, circular, right? That's a striated skeletal muscle cell and has multiple nuclei on it. So that nuclei has a lot of genetic information in it. That's what makes skeletal muscle so unique. And, you know, skeletal muscle is also striated this way, right? So within these nuclei here and here and here, we have genetic information. So now it, let's just focus back on this circular cell here. So we know in the nucleus, we have these things called chromosomes, right? And the chromosomes, they make up the genome, all right? So a genome is all of your genetic information. And in this particular drawing, the genome is the 23 chromosomes in the nucleus that have all of your genetic information. Okay, so all of the genetic information is in that region. Now, once we kind of zoom in on some of these chromosomes, which you can see I did that on this purple guy here, um, so here's my, here's just one chromosome, right? That chromosome is made up of very complex strands of DNA. So if we follow this out, you can start seeing here that we're seeing the helix, right? We're starting to see that familiar shape. We can see that, you know, this one might run this way and this one might run this way. And once we get over here to where I widen it right there, you can see that this is what we've been talking about, right? A, T, C, G, G, C, uh, A, T, right? So that information that we've been talking about this last lecture here is all bound um, and raveled within these complex DNA strands which make these chromosomes, right? So that's something I wanted to show you. I wanted to kind of show you where all that information is. And then also we have what we call the mitochondria, right? I'm just going to put mito, M-I-T-O. And the mitochondria in the cell also has its own genetic information. It has its own DNA, right? So exercise can also change the DNA in the mitochondria. And we can upregulate or we can create more proteins that are beneficial for something like beta oxidation, right? Which is something that we use a ton of when we are running, right? So the cell could have multiple adaptations to exercise and it could happen either 
in the genetic nuclear information here, with it, which is in the nucleus, or it could happen here in the mitochondria, kind of depending on what the stimulus is. If we're having... Um, if we're having uh, a lot of weightlifting per se, well, what might happen in the mitochondria, and I'm going to just pick a, a dark color, what might happen in the mitochondria is we might start shutting down some genes, right? And that's why I picked red, right? We might start shutting, shutting down some genes that are responsible for increasing, let's say, the citric acid cycle, right? Um, and if you guys know what the citric acid cycle is, that is what a lot of runners use when they are metabolizing fatty acids during exercise. But because we're weightlifting so much with, uh, or we're strength training and we're doing so much anaerobic activity, the mitochondria might start to downregulate some of those enzymes that caught, that we use when we exercise um, aerobically, right? And I, we could say enzyme A, enzyme B, whatever, just generically things will shut down because we don't need it, right? But this, this uh, genetic information, it might start revving certain things up. Let's say more myosin and actin, right? Which are structural, comport uh, st structural proteins which increase strength. I'm going to say S&P, strength and power, right? So... Uh, I'll say green in this one just to say, okay, well, green means go. Green's like a good thing. We're, we're, we're making more of it. So maybe the myosin and actin gene is right here. And maybe that's going to start upregulating itself, producing more of these proteins to help us gain strength. Okay. So that's just, a, a, just I'm just kind of giving you an example of how we can turn genes on and off. Now let's look at another kind of variation of this. Okay. So again, a gene or a genome is all the nuclear, uh, the nuclear, all the genetic information or the nuclear DNA. So I, I drew you that picture of the cell. Okay. Let me draw it one more time. Let's just, let's just beat a dead horse. Okay. Here's the cell. Here's the nuclei, and inside the nuclei we have, I'm just going to put N, we have the genome. And the genome is all of the genetic material, okay? That's where it's housed. Now, we can take um, one of the chromosomes, right? So let's just focus on this right here, okay? I'm going to focus on this. Okay, we know the chromosomes are in the DNA or are in the nuclei. So we're going to focus on that. We're going to drag that down here. Okay, now this is a chromosome and a chromosome is one segment of DNA. Okay, it's just an individual segment. Okay, now in this chromosome, we literally have hundreds and thousands of genes. Okay, so what is a gene? So I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to zoom in right here on this, right? And we're going to pull that down here. Okay. Now these are genes. Okay. This is a gene. This is a gene. This is a gene. Okay. This is where we house the genetic information. Okay. We have exons and introns. I'm not going to talk about that on this lecture. I'll talk about that on another lecture, but right now I'm just trying to show you um, how this all fits within the big picture. Now you might be saying, okay, well, what is a gene? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked. So let's focus on this gene right here. And let's go down like this and let's zoom in on what a gene looks like. And once we get to the gene, we start to see this. And here is where we get back to all of the lectures that we've had on the base pairs the nitrogen bases, the backbone of phosphate and sugar, right? And we start talking about all the different Legos that we've been playing with, right? And that is what a gene looks like. So when I tell you guys that exercise, and whether we're training athletes, whether we're training people who are sick or morbidly obese, or we're training um, high-level Olympians. When we exercise, the first thing to change and to start adapting 
is this. Okay, and ultimately, this will change. Exercise will turn on a part of a chromosome, right, right here. That chromosome will have a bunch of different genes. We'll just say one, two, three, right? If we focus on this one here, what happens now is this component of DNA will produce, let's just, let's just keep building on here, will produce a segment of RNA, and that RNA will start to create proteins. I am, sorry, that will help us get bigger, stronger, and faster. Okay. I hope that makes sense. And I do expect you to watch this and we rewatch this several times. Okay. Let's go back to the slides again. Okay, guys, um, I'm really trying hard to keep these lectures under an hour. So um, if we were meeting in person, we'd meet twice a week. We would have two lectures. And right now I have exceeded uh, with the first lecture and this lecture, I've exceeded the two hours. So I'm going to stop here. Um, of course, we have a couple more slides. Um, I, I, right now I'm on slide 30 and I'm Xing this out because um, this might be just a tad bit too difficult to explain this right now. So you're not responsible for this slide, um, nor are you responsible for this slide. So I'm going to start kind of punting some of these just because I do want to keep these things under an hour just to be fair to you guys. And I think the drawing is going to be very, very helpful. Um, and it's also very necessary, but it's going to chew into some of the slides. Uh, and I'm okay with that. Um, Slide 32 through slide 37, um, we will talk about, but I will we actually, it, it kind of lays over nicely with next week's lecture. So I'm okay with kind of stopping at slide 30, uh, 29. Uh, I'm, I'm okay stopping there. And then the rest of them I'll pick up on. But it, the reason I did that drawing is because now you're going to start seeing some of these things, right? Like this, I was just talking about with this with you. So I'm kind of setting the stage up right now to kind of get into some of the nucleosomes and, and the histones um, and talk about how DNA is organized and regulated. Um, but we can cover all that next week. So I'm going to stop there. You guys definitely have your hands full and um, I will uh, see you guys very soon. So take care and have a great day.